Good morning. Thank you for joining me for my daily Come Follow Me study of the Book of Mormon. Today is November 2nd, and we're going to start off with a prayer. You guys going to fold your arms? Thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this morning. We are grateful for this day before us. We're thankful for this moment that we have come together as friends over YouTube to study thy word and to hear thy messages. We're grateful for thy love and support and kindness, and we ask thee to please watch over and bless those who are seeking thee or who are trying to find those who are seeking thee. We love thee, Father, so very much, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. So, oh, nope, daily reflection. Get on camera when you're not wearing pants. All right. The second. Therefore, I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Third Nephi chapter 12, verse 48. Ultimately, perfection comes as a gift from God to the faithful. A little at a time, as we put off the natural man and seek the things of eternity, we become changed in Christ. We cannot attend attain perfection on our own so we go forward faithfully walking the righteous path none of us will become perfect in a day or a month or a year as president gordon b hinckley said um, we will not accomplish it in a lifetime but we can begin now starting with our more obvious weaknesses and gradually converting them to strengths this quest may be a long one, in fact, will be lifelong. It may be fraught with many mistakes, with falling down and getting back up again, but we must not sell ourselves short. We must make a little extra effort, kneel before God in supplication. He will comfort, sustain, and bless us. Our eternal quest is to become like the Father and the Son, perfect. I think I'm going to send that one to Hannah. Um, okay. So today is Mormon chapter five. And the happiness continues. Um, he even, he even says in here that he doesn't even write all of their wickedness and their misdeeds because he doesn't want us to lament too much for them. He doesn't want us to sorrow too much for them. And I think that is a very telling thing that if these chapters are just a heavy weight that, that we're enduring or that we're, what words am I trying to say? I'm not quite sure. Like we feel this heavy weight of these chapters, the sorrow that we're feeling for this people, for Mormon and Moroni. Yet he's like, I'm not going to tell you everything because I don't want you to, you know, be weighed down too much with grief. You're just like, oh my gosh, if I'm feeling this for what he has written, what isn't he writing? He's saying that they're sacrificing women and children. What's worse? But I don't want to think about it. Because I don't want to think about it. But anyways, that's what he says. But I did find a gratitude verse. A verse that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for verse 19. And behold, the Lord hath reserved their blessings, which they might have received in the land for the Gentiles who shall possess the land. So, most, most of all of this, you're, you're just grateful you're not there, that you're not one of the, the Nephites or the Lamanites. You're just grateful it's not you. But this verse, verse 19, I'm grateful for this verse because it's like he's reserving the blessing. The blessing doesn't leave. It may leave one people and go to another, but the blessing will still be on the earth. It'll be for those who are righteous. He doesn't remove his blessing completely. He has promised a blessing to those who follow him and he will fulfill his promises. He doesn't say, okay, 
if this set of people does this thing, here's the blessing they get. And if they don't do this thing, nobody gets the blessing. That's not what he's saying here. And I'm grateful for that. Well, let's get into our commentary. I'm so glad it's Saturday and I can maybe take a nap today. Alex has come down at 1 a.m. two nights in a row. And it has not been fun. But it is what it is. Um, Mormon has been commanded to write the things that he observes, but he anguishes over being the messenger of so much carnage and havoc. Therefore, he gives but an abridgment sufficient to convey the consequences of wickedness, but without overreaching the tolerable limits of sorrow among his readership. His mission is to persuade the Jews, Gentiles, and the remnants of the house of Israel that Jesus is the Christ. Truly, the Book of Mormon is a divine witness prepared by the Lord to convince all mankind to come unto Christ, to know of his goodness and to honor the covenants we make with him. Oh, that we might be persuaded to come unto Christ more fully and forsake the world. The Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ designed to strengthen our faith and serve as a Leahona to guide us home again. The Greatness, His Great and Eternal Purpose. After nearly a millennium of painstaking archiving of the history, historical record by an uninterpreted series of inspired prof, uninterrupted series of inspired prophets, beginning with Lehi and Nephi, the sacred trust is passed on to Mormon, who is guided to write the message of truth to future Gentiles, to the future house of Israel, and unto all the ends of the earth so that the Lord's plan of salvation might go forward in the latter days according to the heavenly design unto the fulfilling of his covenant. Ultimately, Mormon will hide up all the records in the hill Cumorah, save it were these few plates which I give unto my son Moroni. In this manner, the extraordinary chain of witnesses continues until the final hours of the Nephite nation and then is suspended until Moroni, the last of the archivists, appears as a resurrected messenger of God to the prophet Joseph Smith at the dawn of a new and glorious dispensation. President Ezra Taft Benson succinctly expressed the purpose of the Book of Mormon. It should be comforting to all Latter-day Saints that the Lord has given great promises in that sacred volume, the Book of Mormon, promises that should give us comfort and assurance on the condition that we live the gospel. How I wish that every person would read the Book of Mormon and in it the prophetic history of the, Amer of the Americas and the clear warnings to the future. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland speaks of the power of the Book of Mormon to bring about a miraculous spiritual transformation. The Book of Mormon is the sacred expression of Christ's great last covenant with mankind. It is a new covenant, a new testament from the new world to the entire world. Reading it was the beginning of my light. It was the source of my first spiritual certainty that God lives, that he is my heavenly father, and that, of, and that a plan of happiness was outlined in eternity for me. It led me to love the Holy Bible and the rest of the standard works of the church. It taught me to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to glimpse his merciful compassion, and to consider the grace and grandeur of his atoning sacrifice for my sins and the sins of all men, women, and children, from Adam to the end of time. The light I walk by is his light. His mercy and magnificence lead me in my witness of him to the world. Oh, I love Jeffrey. All right. One last one. They had Christ for their shepherd. Now behold, they are led about by Satan. The Book of Mormon abounds in contrast. At one time the people were delightsome, being led by the Father and the Son. Now they are as chaff before the wind, or as a ship without a sail or steerage. When the people are pridefully ensconced in iniquity, they are rudderless and without noble aims. 
only through faith in Jesus Christ, through whom, through humility and obedience, and through honoring covenant promises, can a people emerge from the mortal veil in a state of spiritual liberty and joy, having stayed the course toward our heavenly des destination. It's interesting or fitting that we're in these declining chapters of the Book of Mormon when it feels like the state of the country is in decline. To be as Mormon and lament the wickedness of the people. And I fear that right now the state of the country is more the wickedness of the government than it is the people. I feel that the majority of the people have faith in God. It, the, they call it the silent majority, but I feel that the people have faith in God. I fear it's the squeaky wheel who is godless and the government who has abandoned God. To be as Mormon and lament the state of the squeaky wheel and the government. The, all we can do is raise our families in righteousness, stand for truth and righteousness, and if worse comes to worse for the next four years, is we can prepare for the second coming because if worse comes to worst, if the worst scenario happens, the country will continue to decline. Civilization will continue to decline. All we can do is be a light. As Jeffrey said, walk in his light. All right. It is the second. It's day 307. Is it? Did I flip a page? Yes, I did. Whoops, a daisy. Okay. Wayne E. Brickley. Unselfish family prayer. As individuals need armor, so do whole families. No wonder Brigham Young Jr. warned that a certain influence tempts us to skip our family prayer and to thus miss out on the tenfold pleasure of he promised. Each family is entitled to draw heaven into the home, to rejoice in its friendship and nearness. Home need not be a lonely speck. It can be cradled day and night among the hosts of heaven. By prayer we open a curtain. God doesn't make a show, of course. His closeness is not stark and tangible during the mortal adventure, but by regular family visits to sacred ground, we let the Father fuse his might to the hearts gathered before him. More than any watchful parent, he sees problems before we do. Because of frequent family prayers, he often solves problems without making a fuss. We permit him to lighten burdens and lead us from temptation. Prayer after prayer, we give him our ongoing permission to breathe his peace among us. He is present in his own remarkable way. Love leads us to care about the fearsome moments our dear ones may face this hour or this day. Faith leads us to plead for them. Those who pray only for themselves have little grasp of the power of prayer. Unselfish prayer is pleading to the Lord. He answers it. A tenfold pleasure is ours in the safety and goodness of our homes, the wonder of answer after answer from God himself to our little families as the years go by. That's a good one. I'm going to share that one with Malia. All right. 
Uh, that was Mormon chapter 5, and tomorrow we do Mormon chapter 6. We will end it with a read it, do it. Mormon chapter 5, they highlight verse 23. Know ye not that ye are in the hands of God? Know ye not that he hath all power? Remind yourself of this today. All right. <sighs> Let's end it off with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the this wonderful day. We're thankful for thy love and support and kindness. We're grateful for our many blessings. Father, we ask that thou would please watch over and bless our loved ones as they go about their day. Bless them with thy spirit that they may do the things that thou would have them do to walk in righteousness and to be led away from temptation. We're grateful for this country that we have and we ask thee, Father, so very dearly to let honesty and peace reign during this next week. Honesty with the voting, honesty with those counting the votes, and honesty with those tallying the votes, submitting the votes, and the Electoral College. Unless it is thy will that, that honesty does not reign and, and the coming of the Lord is at hand. We love thee, Father, so very much, and we ask thee to please bless us with understanding for everybody, no matter which way the election goes. We love thee, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Bye.